Добрый день всем, кто сегодня присоединился к нам на нашу дискуссию, которая будет сегодня посвящена теме цикличности, но цикличности такой, привязанной конкретно к фургонистическим каким-то темам. Мы ее так и назвали «Зацикленные». Да? Очень похоже на какое-то название сериала. Но тем не менее, сегодняшние вопросы... Выключить. Вопросы экономики замкнутого цикла на сегодняшний день весьма популярны. О них много говорят. И бывает так, about что them. за вот каким-то названным смыслом... And sometimes, uh, when there is an interesting term, we forget about the meaning. Because closed cycle economy for people sounds like some mantra, and they don't know how to understand it, how can it be used for some practical purposes, whether we are talking about a large corporation and small companies. And this is really a very topical thing to talk about. And now I'd like to introduce the speakers of this session. First of all, Patrick Wiedemann, General Director, Reverse Logistics Group. Patrick. Good day. Our next speaker, Sam Pahetan, founder and general director of WIM. Sampo, good day. Natalia Benislavska, head uh, of the Department of Sustainable Development, IKEA Group, Russia. And we also have another extremely interesting speaker, Jana Sinesio, Director for Sustainable Development, X5 Retail Group. Jana, good morning. And I propose a full structure for today. We have one hour time. We are five people. You are the speakers, and I'm just the moderator. I'm going to be here to support you, maybe to highlight some of the topics, and I will be managing the time. I'm sure you have a lot to say, and I'll give you the floor a little bit later. I'm going to ask you questions as a moderator, because we do not have the audience here and uh, we do have uh, people who listen to the translation, the broadcast. That's why I will be asking the questions. But if there are some questions, possibly you can also ask them online. Every speaker will have 10 minutes to present their topic, to present their case, success or failure, maybe some advantages and disadvantages, or some con uh, conclusions that you've made for the future. And then everyone who is listening to us today will know more about your success, they will know about this cycled economy, and they will know more about your practical experience. Patrick, I'd like to start with you. And my question to you is the following. Tell us about your implementation of sustainable development principles. I do know that your company had some experience with going to the Russian market. We are in Russia now, and we are talking about the lessons which we can learn for our country. The global experience says that linear principles they do not work, population is growing, consumption is growing, and uh, some reasonable goals 
which we have among other sustainable development goals. Uh, this is rational consumption, rational manufacturing. That sounds like something uh, high bro, but how do we implement it in practice? In practice, we see that for years we've been getting the habits and it's difficult to forget about those habits overnight, not because we are not conscientious people, because we don't want to be good citizens, but simply because there are some events and it's difficult to uh, forget about everything that we have in our life. Patrick, the floor is yours and give us some comments about your experience in Russia. Well, Natalie, thank you very much and a uh, great pleasure being here and, and welcome everybody here. Um, and yeah, for the opportunity of us uh, from RLT sharing our experiences uh, so far, um, being since uh, more than two decades or mid of the 90s starting to implement reverse solutions and um, yeah I'm very happy to to share our experiences uh, that we have made with also uh, the focus on um, how can change really happen how is that possible to implement stronger circular economy approaches and and uh, as you rightly pointed out Natalie it's it's about how are we able to engage the consumer, how can habits be changed uh, in that way. Uh, and definitely this is something that is necessary to achieve because if we're not able to change habits, uh, we won't succeed in here. And this is something where we need everybody's support and help. And uh, let me just uh, share my screen here um, to give you an, an overview. And I've chosen principally a few examples of how we are able to, to get to that point of, of changing habits. And if, if you look into uh, principle, the situations of um, yeah, in, in Germany uh, back in the 90s or in, uh, I would say in, in Russia still today and many, many other parts of the world in, in the same way that waste management, and I don't wanna even call it really management, it's a waste disposal, uh, so far is easy in the way of saying everything gets collected more or less in one bin. You got to make sure that that you get it out of the way. People want to get rid of things. Uh, and uh, uh, the simplest way is just in all in one bin, put it on a truck, uh, drive it uh, to a landfill or drive it to an incinerator uh, and get rid of the waste. Well, obviously, from what we believe, what a circular economy should be and recapturing the resources. And we all do know we live way beyond the capacity of our planet already. So we need to change those habits in coming into uh, a much more future oriented uh, part of making our planet greener and reusing those resources, which means we cannot just landfill them or cannot just burn them in here. But then we exactly, we come to the point of like, well, how can we get from that simple solution all in one bin now, especially, and just looking at Moscow as, as one of a mega city uh, in here of, of how can you make that change management uh, going forward? Because suddenly it, it really becomes a much bigger challenge than just uh, managing it uh, in, in a simple way because you've got infrastructure constraints, you've got traffic constraints, you've got obviously large space constraints uh, around there. And, and through this, you need to think about complete new mechanisms, how to get to a waste management that works more efficient and in a better way. And um, based on this, I, I've prepared um, three sample slides principally to, to walk through the topic uh, here and, and get to the point of how this change can happen. And in principle, we have to say, new technology digitalization um, is very clearly an enabler to come to much more efficient setups and, and processes to, to come of what I show here of how to manage that complete cycle from a consumer or a collection point uh, all the way through the logistical processes of uh, sorting and consolidation then into either reuse streams of refurbishment and remarketing if it is reusable products or to the point of having a material recovery in a proper recycling process uh, to be set up. And what we clearly believe here is you need to get to an end-to-end -end approach 
uh, in that part. You need to understand how to manage the collection. This is where it starts. Um, how to make that a very data-driven process. And this is how we operate in our systems in here to, to say you're, you're using apps as interfaces in here to start an order of a pickup, for example, not just have standardized milk runs, but do dynamic milk runs that optimize the logistical processes in here that help you to cope with the thing of what are traffic times and so on. When is the easiest way of picking up bins? Um, have predictive algorithms that help us to learn out of the data, when is a bill potentially full at which area? And mass data and smart data today allows us to do that um, in, in a very good manner to, to come to really an agile and, and the real-time dependent service uh, that will help us to cope with, as I said, the, the infrastructural constraints that we do see in, in mega cities. And then going forward, you need to understand your mass flows. You need track and trace mechanisms uh, behind that. And you need to understand the quality of the material. And this is where this end-to-end -end comes in uh, as a very important element, because you might be able to do further segregation and spend more cost at the front of the collection versus knowing that you get a much better quality of materials and looking at resource efficiency, we want to achieve what we would call minimum recycling or even an upcycling and definitely not a downcycling, which still happens in most of the countries around the globe at this point of time, because co-mingled material has contaminations and stuff. So even if you have recyclable material, the recycling and recovery percentage still remains low because the quality of the collected material is not on the level that you would need it, for example, for for food packaging to become food packaging again due to the hygienic uh, requirements and so on that are behind that. So it, it's really into understanding all these moving parts, understanding the costs in the process, understanding the values that you get out of it to through this achieve, first of all, a, a process that works at all, but at the same time, a process that really ensures the lowest cost of ownership because we all know uh, in the end, it has to be an efficient process as well because I'm a true believer of saying sustainability in itself also needs to be financially sustainable. It doesn't help if things are only cost in, in that part. We need to come to models that economically also work out and they do work out. So this is nothing that bites itself or, or is excluding uh, itself. And another part is there is infrastructure today in place. That infrastructure is useful. You might need to use it in a little bit of different way but definitely it is there and all the systems that you're looking at need to be inclusive of that whole thing. And coming to our experience, uh, when we were looking into the, the Russian market ourselves a couple of years ago, well, we principally failed in that part of feeling that the way the waste management was set up is, is still done very, very traditional and people who have certain vested interest in doing the business the way they do it at this point of time and that there was a lack of, of seeing the opportunity how this can be changed and even maybe also the pressure and the need and understanding for this not being so high and the awareness needed. Um, that, that we at that point said we think it's a bit too early to now really successfully be able to make that transition and transformational process uh, at that time. But well, we all know how quick the world is developing. So we are very happy to, to look into this uh, again, knowing that there is quite a potential and, and at the same time, I think also quite a need for new sustainable solutions to be built up. Going forward a little bit more into details of um, how can we collect certain specific materials in here? And one part is that if you go into serialized tracking management and put a deposit mechanism behind it, we know it, for example, in, in, in uh, Scandinavian countries and in Germany with beverage packaging, this is a model that has shown to achieve through that incentive of deposit, very high collection rates of very good material quality at the same time. But to bring this to a next level and to really be able to deploy that in a mega city uh, in, in the proper manner with, again, infrastructural constraints, we believe smart DRS as being the next level of DRS systems in here with serialization being used is ensuring that you can 
enable a collection infrastructure beyond retail that will still deliver in a much higher convenience the same material quality and achieving the same goals in a more uh, efficient way and in a fraud protected way because again we know deposit systems uh, always there's a lot of money in the game with the deposit amounts so there is a vested interest of certain people to try to get money out of the system and have fraudulent activities so we think and we have developed technology that allows us to also control that process securely while having certain um, packaging materials collected in a very good manner. And the last example and the thought point uh, also for the discussion session today is looking into new developments, new areas of mobility, and we all know we're talking about uh, EV vehicles um, and electro mobility going forward, and there's a huge push around the globe um, from a CO2 perspective. But I think, again, this is a part that has a huge relevance when it comes to resource management. We, we know how much more materials we will need to produce all these batteries. And we know, again, there is limitation. So we need to come to, again, the circular approach right from the beginning to make this a sustainable uh, effort and, and make uh, electric mobility real economical viable throughout the whole process and think it already right from the beginning, um, which will mean, again, the digital uh, platforms will be enabler, digital battery passports will help us to overcome the barriers that we have in current bat battery management where there's a very low value retention throughout, again, downcycling that is happening. And we need to look into how can we make this better? How can we collect data of the product at the right time of the product lifetime that will also help to engage all the people that are in the process and that are part of that reverse chain to really close the loops and through this come to a, a productive reuse cycle of products and at the very end a very productive recycling management that enable us to recover the resources that are in these batteries and yeah i think a huge opportunity looking into that new market uh, coming up if we do it in the right way from the beginning and with this thank you for the opportunity and looking forward to the discussion throughout the session Thank you very much, Patrick. It's a great pleasure that uh, the key point of your whole today's micro uh, presentation was finance, because for some reason many people perceive the topic of cyclical economics and uh, separate uh, garbage collection through the uh, prism of activism or um, non-commercial movements like uh, clean water, clean, uh, uh, clean air, but no one mentions that this is a business and every business should be analyzed, calculated, and as you correctly mentioned, this basis for management of uh, waste, efficient waste management, should be uh, put on uh, um, analyzed ground. And so I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, can, do you plan to come back to Russia? You mentioned that at that time some solutions were preemptive and probably too early because not all, everybody was uh, ready. But how do you evaluate today the uh, recurrent situation in Russia? No, definitely we are highly interested uh, to, to come back uh, into the market um, and start activities here. Uh, the, the key evaluation point really for us is in how can we prepare the ground in the right manner because to make that change happen, it needs the collaboration of various stakeholders and definitely it needs the support of the regulators to, to get to a level playing field for all the actors and yeah, extended producer responsibility schemes are a proven concept in, in uh, many other countries to, to be the possibility to, to get the ground um, to then implement such systems and foster the change uh, to happen. And, and this is the evaluation for us of seeing how can we jointly with the regulators, us not as lobbying for this, but us as giving our experience and the advocacy about what works and how does it work to then find suitable solutions that will also work in the Russian market. 
As far as I understand the regulator, it is really important from the point of view of visualization of you and your services. And factually, everything else will be lying, will be connected with the efficiency and uh, attracting you, involving you as uh, and, and, and adaptation of uh, processes and uh, mm, just keeping the business sense, something like that. You, you mentioned uh, 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 e-vehicles uh, and uh, um, cars, and today it's very hard to imagine a city without cars in general. Uh, understanding how negative, uh, apart from the pluses, how negative impact cars um, bring to the environment. But we cannot get rid of them, but probably we can try uh, imagine uh, our car in someone else's hands. And I'd like to pro give the floor to um, Sampo Hietanian, who uh, will uh, tell us about the service which um, presents uh, the company uh, he founded. And he will explain us what is car sharing today and how sharing shared cars would uh, help to reach the sustainability goals and cyclical goals in the city. Sampo, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Honored to be here. So I take a bit of a different angle to circular economy and, and how it works and how it will actually affect in the cities in the future. Uh, sorry about that. Can you see my screen now? Just a second. Let me try again. Sampo, if you uh, like, I have your presentation and I can pull it up for you on the screen. All right. If you, let's see which one is faster. I should be on it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something went wrong with uh, with the computer. This is really good for a startup CEO that something goes wrong with the... Let me try again now. Oh, now... Now, uh, can you allow me to share again? Is it now? Are we on? All good? All right. Uh, a bit more than just car share. I'll tell about a concept called mobility as a service, uh, which is nicely, as I've seen also in, in some of the Moscow and St. Petersburg and, and in many of the Russian cities' politics also moving forward. What it is about is, is um, how the, the world of mobility will be disrupted. And this is what I'm, what I'm trying to present. And to me, at least, uh, it is about it, it is about asking a question of what can we do to actually compete with cars in previous discussion or previous presentation we asked about it it has to be about business the same applies actually to the disruption of mobility but this business is a b2c business because the the question is more about what do we have to do to actually compete in the minds of people about what would be better than owning a car. And this has to do with our individual freedom. And since car is an individual thing that we, we all have, we have to come up with something better, not just in the minds of, and I'm a transport engineer myself, and, and we tend to, as transport engineers, we tend to want to rationalize this. If the world was given to us as, as transport engineers, I would put everyone to walk to metro station then use this one, then use that one exactly as I say. Uh, but sadly, people don't work that way. That's why they buy their cars, even though it's not really rational. I'll tell an example of, of Tokyo. In, in Tokyo, which is a megacity like, like Moscow, 
uh, over 50% of the cars are used less than once a week, less than once a week. And that sounds like, whoa, these people are silly. Why don't they use it this and this? But the right question we should be asking, what do, we, what do I have to promise here to all of you in the audience that you would give up your car? And of course, business-wise, give me the same money. And the answer is, we have to be able to guarantee that you can go anywhere, anytime, just on a whim, which means that we have to have public transportation in the same convenient app. We have to have car shares. We have to have car rentals. We have to have uh, ride hails. We have to have bikes, micro mobility, everything in one. And actually with a service guarantee that we can really take you there, really open all of those services to people. Now, I'm claiming that for both for circular economy and sustainability, uh, this is the biggest question of our times. Why? We're talking about an industry that for people, it's 10 times as big as this. And the disruption in, mobile, in, in mobile world or telecom was a big thing, but people spent 10 times more in actual, actual getting around. So we are talking about a $10 trillion market. 76% of that market is lying on that car, a car that is used only 4% of the time, completely underused assets. So it is quite obvious that this will be disrupted one way or another. Someone will crack this formula, but not without giving people the sense of freedom and choice and individuality, what car brings us as, a, as sort of a freedom enabler. Uh, but putting all together, we can do it. Sustainability, by 2030 in Europe, 40% of all carbon emissions are coming from transportation. It is the only industry in the world that has not improved since the 90s, even though we've seen that the cars have developed quite a lot. This is, of course, not, not doable anymore. We understand that. At the same time, we made a big survey in European cities. 38% are actually willing and waiting for a solution to replace their cars. That means today, we have 70 million cars waiting to be replaced. So there is an answer to this. There is an answer that doesn't actually take that much. Uh, what we have to do is utilize the assets that exist. So like I explained in the previous slide, if we put, and, and this you can ask yourself individually, if we put, uh, if I tell you in the whole of Russia, not just in Moscow, not just in St. Petersburg, you can hop on any bus, any train, any young old ride, any other taxi, any car share, any car rental, any scooter, any bike, and that would be even less of a cost than your car. Would you give up your car for that? Or what if I tell you that not just in Russia, I will give you roaming of the whole world. So when in New York, just hop on a taxi, hop on a subway, hop on anything you want, and with the same price as your car, would you be able to give up your car? Or if even on top of that, I guarantee that when you do need the car, I'll give you a better car than what you actually can own at the moment. The good part of this is that the pieces are there. Everything that we need to make this happen in Moscow, in, in Jakarta, in, in Santiago de Chile, they do exist. All we have to do is use the digitalization, the digital means to combine all of them and really start competing against car ownership. That is what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sampo. Very interesting. Uh, indeed, people in uh, cities, in big cities, uh, uh, ask themselves more and more this question, not only in as regards cars, but such uh, demanded uh, service as uh, furniture, a rental for your rented uh, flat. Instead of buying furniture, you can rent it, and it's also a rational step which you can calculate. You are absolutely right. Today, car owners sometimes face the uh, problem of not uh, of the impossibility of use your car calculating the time which they normally don't have enough and we start pressure our time more 
and we start uh, measuring time and uh, we start try to um, uh, roll over to, to our gadgets, try to um, optimize as much as possible our time and our environment, our space. And by cleaning up this space, we try to analyze pluses and minuses here and this level of mobility by keeping individuality as you clearly stressed in your presentation would be a great and uh, I'd like to move from mobility to uh, th to a different plane a different kind of uh, uh, question that to introduce our third speaker. Now I'd like to present Natalia Benislavska our third speaker she works for IKEA Russia and uh, she is working for a rather cutting-edge company who started, which started uh, introducing uh, recycling and uh, sustainable methods very long ago. I uh, had a lot of projects with IKEA. Uh, we uh, were implementing some of the new initiatives together, and I'd like to Natalia to talk us about them because everyone can take a decision, can take a justified decision by calculating its economic efficiency. Natalia from IKEA, I, you have a great case about furniture. I think it's really amazing. We used to be no, less mobile. We were not moving houses so often before. But now, if you're moving to a new apartment, that's a, the normal thing. When we move, we always think uh, uh, whether we should buy or whether we should uh, use our existing furniture. That's great if we have a choice to simply rent furniture. And your case about furniture is absolutely unique. You also have some projects which help people to get rid of old furniture uh, by saving the environment. I would like to ask you tell us more about them. Natalia, good day. Thank you very much for introducing me. I'm very happy to be here speaking after Patrick and Samper because my topic is connected is what they were talking about. And I'm going to talk about closed cycle economy and the way we implement such economy at IKEA, about our aspirations and about implementation of uh, this idea and about the sharing economy too. I do hope you can see my presentation now. Yes, we can see it. Great. Each big company, any big company, in our view, especially uh, big companies, they should be going into sustainable development. It's just a hygienic factor because um, we think that when there is a volume, there is responsibility. We consume 1% uh, of all the wood in the world and 1% of all the cotton in the world. Uh, I mean, IKEA company. And um, this uh, um, makes us responsible for all of our processes. And we are happy to be responsible, to take on this responsibility. First of all, I'd like to say a couple of words about our st sustainable development strategy. This is something which is like a foundation for um, all of our actions. Uh, we have three subdivisions of this strategy. First of all, healthy and environmental um, family life, um, household life. We are helping our consumers uh, to be more environmental friendly through our products and services. Uh, second, uh, second stream, that's caring for the environment and closed cycle economy. We want to be uh, an environmental company. Um, we have energy saving initiatives and so on. Uh, the things which uh, we produce our products from. And the third stream that's equal opportunities and fair treatment of our employees. 
Today we are talking about the cycled uh, people, the cycled processes. So I'm talking about our manufacturing processes and about our sustainable uh, development um, principles. In Russia, three years ago, we decided in our sustainable development initiatives to focus on the closed cycle economy. This is something that we want to promote here in Russia, and we've started doing it quite actively. Uh, so we are interested to move in from mass consumption to mass cycled economy, closed cycle economy, because overconsumption is one of the major challenges in the world and in Russia especially. When we are talking about environmental household uh, activities, uh, here we can mention uh, several main goals, which are major goals. The first one is the goal to inspire our consumers. We want them to be the part of uh, our processes. We focus on closed cycle consumption and shared consumption. First of all, we have lots of goods which help our consumers to have environmental friendly processes at home. Uh, they are products for recycling at home. We make, uh, we help them to make these processes beautiful, inspiring. We have different solutions for very different types of premises. We want our consumers to be happy about um, starting this recycling at home. Besides, every product that we manufacture uh, takes into account uh, sustainable design principles. I don't want to go into very technical details, but information is here on the slide. We want our, all of our products to have some standard components, and as a result, we will be able to adapt uh, them for new lifestyles of our consumers. Uh, we have teams of people who think about making our products not just beautiful and uh, functional, but also sustainable. Another important part uh, of this process is the fact that we have a lot of people who are thinking on how to make products from recycled materials. And in Russia, we've made a good progress uh, here. Around 10% of IKEA products, including products in Russia, they are already made from recycled materials. And um, if you pop into any IKEA store, you will see posters about it. We are very actively communicating with our consumers, uh, telling them about what we do. And by 2030, we want to make sure that all the materials that we use for manufacturing uh, is a recyclable or um, is as such a recycled uh, material. As for closed cycle services, we have a new concept according to which our consumers will be able to mend or renew products they have um, if they didn't manage to um, continue using it, so we'll give them an opportunity to share or to sell this product. And if not, uh, they will be able to submit it for recycling. Uh, this is a part of the reduce, reuse, recycle principle. And in September, we were happy to start uh, this network of services which will help our consumers before sending a product to a landfill think several times what could be done uh, with this furniture. Mend, um, restyle, uh, sell, um, give for free, sell to IKEA. So there are different options what they can do about their products. And I'll tell you more about an event that we've organized. We decided to not to organize Black Friday, but we had environmental 
Friday instead of the Black Friday. And during a week from the 24th of December till the 3rd of December, we were accepting from our consumers uh, furniture in good condition through our discount department. And we were giving them more than 60% of the price of this furniture. The service is there, but during uh, this period, the payback was high. A huge number of people used this service during the week. More than 8,000 objects were reused and they uh, found some new owners. As for recycling, recycling of furniture, it's a really very problematic issue uh, because until recently there were no companies who, which could recycle furniture. So we couldn't find any contractors uh, for us. But we were interested in starting this process. Furniture for us is the heart of our business model, and we knew that our consumers needed a service. And we started um, a pilot project in St. Petersburg. We were accepting furniture, any type of furniture, not only IKEA made from consumers, and then we were sending it for recycling to our factories, and it was the basis for um, the manufacturing of new pieces of furniture. It was just a test, and now we plan to open such points of accepting furniture in a large number of services, in a large number of cities. And we actually managed to produce a significant amount of furniture. This was a good scale for the test project. As for our internal processes, we always strive to minimize our influence on the environment. And we were interested in the closed cycle economy part of this uh, thing. Uh, we wanted to show you uh, the situation with the recycling at uh, IKEA. Because, of course, if you are telling somebody about environmental life, we should become environmentally friendly ourselves. We actually doing a lot already. 72% uh, of all the waste is recycled at I IKEA. This is actually for retail um, a record. Natalia, you wanted me to share some figures, so here figures are very attractive. And I do encourage all the companies to recycle internally, because here we have very interesting financial benefit. We really get uh, around 40 million rubles per year due to recycling our materials. And this is a great financial bonus for us. It's not only environmentally friendly, it's also financially profitable. We also are interested uh, to turning these materials back into our products, because I think it's a very good case for other countries, because we have uh, very high requirements for uh, manufacturing, and I think that if we manage to do it uh, within IKEA, this will be easily replicated to other companies. And I tell you about some specific examples. So, first of all, uh, there is one a cycle, uh, cardboard and paper, which is produced as the waste in St. Petersburg uh, store. We use them for producing five or six types of boxes, IKEA boxes, and they are all made from waste paper and cardboard. Chipboard. Uh, there are also some chipboard uh, waste, and we turn it into IKEA furniture at the Istra factory in Russia. And another example, cardboard angles, they are here on the right side. Uh, this is part of a packaging which uh, is protecting pallets uh, from uh, some blows uh, during trans transport. transport. We had some problems with this packaging because it's difficult to 
recycle it. We had to always just send it to the landfills, but then we found one contractor uh, near Solnichnogorsk. Uh, this supplier and contractor uh, agreed to recycle our angles, and they even created some special product for us. I call it a filler for packages. You see, on the right, on the bottom, that's protection for fragile products which we send to our consumers. And it means that the products are protected, but besides, we managed to use this uh, cardboard for the second time. We also have stretch film. It's also sent for recycling, and our contractor produces new film, so this is 100% um, recyclable product. Uh, usually, closed cycle economy products, um, they have uh, zero profitability, but here in this example, we save around 30 percent you know, when we uh, pay for new film. So we are managing to save 30 percent. That's really a very good result for us. Next example, bottles, which we receive from our cons consumers uh, in Mega and IKEA, and this bottle can be used for producing a lot of other products, for example, the fillers, uh, which you see here on the uh, slide. Another example, paper glasses. Uh, they are a pilot project in Himki, a store. In Russia, actually, paper glasses, uh, the paper cups, they are not recycled, unfortunately. Uh, but we managed to change this, and our contractor um, produces paper cup holders for hot glasses, which are also here on the slide. I'd like to thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer your questions. You've actually answered your question. This is profitable. That's not just about saving the environment. It's just about creating a better image and um, improving the credibility. But you also manage to earn money. You are not wasting resources, natural resources, and you are not uh, blowing significant damage to the uh, nature. And this case about uh, paper cups is absolutely unique uh, because these paper cups, they are actually a hated thing if we're talking about environmental uh, friendly processes. But in the city, it's just not possible to um, see a person who doesn't use uh, paper cups. Uh, but unfortunately, it was not possible to find some paper cups which could be recycled, which are just for one-time use. But you've changed that. Uh, and if you're talking about different types of services, I would like to present my, our last speaker, who will be um, our fourth guest for today, Yana Sinesiu, Sustainable Development Director at X5 Retail Group. Yana, uh, tell us uh, about things that you do at X5 Retail Group. Of course, all of your supermarkets are around the cities, so many people use your services, your shops, but what kind of solutions do you propose to your consumers? Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I think that this week is very interesting because uh, there, are, there is a number of sustainable development events this week, and I'm invited a lot, and it means that the topic of sustainable development is in high demand. Maybe not everyone knows about X5 Retail Group, but it's actually the largest 
retailer, a food retailer. We have three main brands, Perikrostok, Pitorochka, and Carousel. I think you know these shops, you know these brands. We have more, more than 17,000 shops and more than 14 million people on a daily basis visit our shops. And um, answering to your question why it is important for the company, uh, for us it's uh, uh, absolutely important. We set it as a strategic priority for us a few years ago because we understood that our scale and our responsibility for the society, for the environment is uh, absolutely huge. We should, we must look in this direction. We as market leaders always set the pace and we have to promote the industry to the right direction. Uh, just two years ago, we designed our sustainable development strategy and we put at the basis the global sustainability goals of till 2030. We did a great job to understand what uh, of those goals are really relevant and important for us and can give a biggest contribution. To do this, first and foremost, we contacted our buyers, uh, our customers. We went to regions. We have active interactions with our customers. We worked a lot and we had a lot of brainstorming sessions with our partners, suppliers and other stakeholders. And based on this work, we determined that we have four main sustainable goals where we can make biggest contribution. This is the community goals, uh, local community support programs. This is the healthcare goal, uh, supporting healthy lifestyle, healthy products, uh, bioproducts. This is the goals in our uh, personnel. We have 300,000 employees, we should provide them equal conditions. And the fourth goal, it's a comprehensive goal of planet. Uh, I'm going to stop a little bit on that. And here is first and foremost about the support of uh, responsible consumption. If we speak about circle economy, now understanding, of course, the main goal is to minimize uh, waste or uh, zero waste even. And one of the way to achieve this is a multi-way package. Uh, we have a few. Or initiatives in that. First of all is our uh, multi-use package. If you come to Perikrostok or you can buy uh, bags uh, uh, for uh, multiple use. And uh, moreover, if you come to weight, to scales, you can have a special bags, um, uh, special net bags, which you can use every time you want to uh, weigh something and buy buy fruit or vegetables. If we compare statistics from 2019 and 2019, the an amount of uh, multi-way bags bought was around 2 million. And uh, if we take two quarters, the uh, first half of the year 2020, this it was already 3 million. People have become more and more responsible, and our people vote with their money uh, for responsible and rational use of resources. And um, on our side, we try to um, uh, enhance it, to support it. We give additional points uh, on loyalty cards for these purchases. If we speak about the reduce of waste to going to um, the landfills here we work a lot. We work a lot with our packaging. The packaging uh, which the consumer gets is first of all it's the uh, d- recycled packages from our bags. In uh, every store you come and buy a bag on the cash desk uh, for 30%. It uh, uh, contains uh, recycled plastic. Uh, six months ago we started a pilot to understand. Uh, how such bags are in line with the quality and requirements which our consumers want to see. Uh, the least thing you want uh, uh, that uh, it bag breaks when you buy your food uh, or other products. We had to test these bags, whether it's uh, resilient and high quality. We did three pilots in our Moscow. And we got not only positive reaction in terms of quality, but we even got some support and that this uh, is an environmental friendly bag. Now we change the requirements to all our supplies and in all Perikrostok stores, around 1,000 stores for the moment, our bags uh, contain 35% of recycled plastic. Uh, 
Another good example is our baskets. In all uh, new concept stores of Pechorochki and Pirikrostek, plastic baskets which you shop uh, are uh, made of recycled plastic. After the uh, after we dispose, we recycle, and the recycle is uh, ended in our stores again. Another very important area is creation of the collection infrastructure. It is a very important topic uh, we are part of, and there are two good initiatives which I wanted to tell you about. First of all is the taking the uh, the packaging for recycling. Uh, a lot of uh, our consumers and the audience uh, have seen such uh, such pendomates or machines which uh, collect aluminium and plastic uh, bottles and uh, and cans, and it helped us to. Um, uh, increase the awareness of uh, this recycling and motivate our clients. If you place a bag there, they get a re discount, a coupon for some goods in the store. Just recently, we introduced another type of these machines in Perikrostok, where you can uh, bring your toothbrush. Toothbrush should be replaced uh, after a few months of use, and it would not be good to throw it out all the landfills. So now we especially have machines where you can bring your used uh, toothbrush, which will be sent for recycling. The second important area in terms of the infrastructure development in the terms of collection is the service which uh, is provided by pericrostock.ru when you order uh, food or products from Precostock are you the courier can uh, bring your foods and can take back your plastic packaging uh, for utilization for, for recycling and disposal and on this slide we show the statistics for 10 months of 2020 we collected a ton of plastic bags which means around 125,000 pieces and uh, it's not the point to stop of course we will move on about our own operations, a few words. We want to be as efficient as possible here, of course. The whole packaging which uh, comes from our operating activities, the whole packaging which can be recycled is recycled. For example, in 2019, we sent more than 590 million kilograms uh, uh, packaging for recycling. 370 of it is uh, cardboard, polyethylene, and plastic boxes, and 220 million are pellets. Inside our operations, we are strongly focused on uh, clear and efficient production, and we do our best to use as much as possible our uh, pellets, our packaging, uh, so multi-way uh, pellets is our main focus. If we speak about food waste, just recently, we've uh, launched a new initiative, which is uh, now uh, getting a, a lot of support in our country. Both Petrovsky and Perikrostok started a project of handing over goods which are still uh, inside the lifetime, but they lost uh, their good uh, appearance uh, to, to to use in some farmer farmers um, around. Uh, 200 farmers uh, get it from us to food the animals and uh, then to dispose it. In 2019, we handed over 45,000 ton of uh, unsold products to uh, farmer facilities, agriculture f firms, and this is a brand new initiative of ours which we want to roll out and scale up. If we speak about plans of the disposal um, development and cycle development, recycle development and reduce of waste, here we have three main plans. First, of course, we plan to continue growing the share of recyclable uh, goods up to 95 percent. We also want to increase the number of uh, products uh, sent for recycling, the products which are, are still uh, sellable but lost their appearance up to 45 percent. But 2030, we want to make the volume of disposed products is 40 percent. And the final one, the very big goal and very big area, is to increase the share of uh, STM goods, of uh, private label goods, up to 50 percent. And the packaging issue is very important issue, by the way. And the first retailer, food retailer, which published own recommendations on what is a responsible packaging, because there is a responsible packaging, disposable packaging, or recyclable one. It is help, helps a lot from the point of view of ecology. And together with all the participants of the value chain, producer of raw materials, packaging producer, FTMG companies, uh, recyclers, 
we verified what is a, a responsible packaging. And based on that, we integrated it in our policy. Now we have an active dialogue with our partners, how they could improve their packaging, what they can do in this area, and what some support is uh, lacking to make sure that there is, will be a responsible packaging on the shelf. Thank you very much, Jana. You all have very extensive presentations. And from uh, all of you, from each of you, dear speakers, uh, in the end, uh, which we are approaching, I wanted to hear just one statement. What is needed and why it is extremely important not to leave ideas of uh, uh, cyclical economy, of the closed-loop economy. But in fact, every one of you already answered this. And uh, Sambo speaking about individuality uh, and uh, economic ability and profitability and keeping mobility. And Natalia speaking about those services which allow people to be involved and responsible. Jana, you involve people. You are a communicator between suppliers of your goods, which you later on sell to people. And Patrick, of course, uh, who uh, basically set the pace and set the tone for this discussion that um, waste management is not just uh, something uh, return something not useful to a useful thing, but efficient uh, management of a new resource. On that point, I'd like to finish our session since we are absolutely now fine with time, which was given to us for this discussion. And we did our best to tell about our great experience. And this is wonderful. Thank you very much to all of you. And for everybody who listened to us, let's uh, get on the loop together. Thank you very much.